our hymnals. Holy, holy, holy. Let's all stand, shall we? Page five. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are not worthy to even say, I don't feel clean enough to say the word holy. And you are holy. And we've just sung that you are the one that rescued us. You're the one that saved us. And Lord, if that doesn't excite us, nothing will. So please work in our hearts. Work and use every teacher today as they teach and preach your word. And Lord, I pray that it will affect us, that we will not leave here like we came in, but because of what you decide to do, our lives will be changed and may be changed drastically. Please, God, do that work in us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You could be seated. Thank you. Page seven, blessed be the name. Page seven. Oh, I'm sorry. The birthdays and anniversaries. Oh, don't worry about it. <laughs> Although I think it's going to be quick because I don't think there's any listed. So it, do we happen to have a birthday this week? Anyone? Anniversaries. Okay. <laughs> All praise to
Lord. And turn the page to page nine. God can do anything but fail. Amen. On the chorus. He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. God can do anything, anything, anything. God can do anything but fail. Amen. Second Samuel, hurry up. Second Samuel, hurry up. You there yet? Second Samuel, we're running out of time. Second Samuel, we want to finish this. I am not a camper. I think camping is ungodly. That's my opinion. The older I get, There are two words that I like more and more and more. My bed. You know how when you camp, sometimes you forget things. Oh, we don't have. But you know you're just camping. So it's temporary. So either you go buy one or you do without it. And I was telling Amy this morning, it feels like we're camping. We're not where we're supposed to be, and nobody's doing what I'm telling them to do, and I have to wait on everybody. You know, you talk to one, and you go, hey, we're ready, waiting on you. He, well, I'm waiting on them, because they're waiting on, so we're just waiting. So we'll just camp, and right? You have fun. We'll just make a campfire and camp out, and someday we'll get to go home to my bed. So we'll... Uh, We'll get through it, but the Lord is good. He's been good, and uh, he stirred my heart this week. He's, he's working. If he's working in me and that's what it's about, then I'll take it. If he's working in you, thank him. Second Samuel 19, Second Samuel 19, how to get over it. David is struggling with getting over the loss of his son, and we don't know the reason. We don't know if he just loved him more than he loved every other child he had or was it that he thought Absalom was lost? Maybe it was that he is, and I kind of think, and I guess if you teach this class, you can express your opinion, but my opinion is that he's feeling guilty over a sin. I don't know how you feel. My biggest problem with sin is not that God doesn't forgive me. It's that I can't forgive myself. And I know God forgives me, and I know all the scripture, and I'll be on my knees you know, with the scriptures open, and I'll pour over what God, what God said, right? That's how I got saved. I didn't get saved because I felt saved. I got saved because he said that if thou should confess with thy mouth. So my forgiveness is the same way. But sometimes, and that's what the devil likes to do, he likes us to feel unforgiven. You feel guilty. You feel like you're not worthy. But boy, all week, I've just been, the devil and I have been going at it, and he's all bruised up. He's all bloody, man, because I'm telling you, God is, God is true. And I have listened at least, the song that the choir sang Sunday night, or not the choir, was it, who was it? To Rescue a Sinner Like Me. I have played that over and over all week. God rescued me. He decided to rescue me. He didn't decide to leave my soul in hell. He decided to rescue me. So I reminded the devil, not just through scripture, not just through prayer, that God has rescued me. And it's possible to forget that, is it not? I think David forgot that, and I think that's what he's wrestling with. And, and Joab just wants him, and you know, I know, Job just wants him to get over it. Verse 1, chapter 19. It was told Job, Behold, the king weepeth and mourneth for Absalom. And the victory that day was turned into mourning unto all the people. For the people heard say that how the king was grieved for his son. The victory, look at verse 2. The victory was turned into mourning. That is nonsensical. 
You don't mourn because of victory. You rejoice because of victory. You, many of us in this room have lost our parents. I can remember my mom died December 23rd. Everybody came over to our house on December 24th. And my kids kept saying, where's dad? Where's dad? I was in the room crying. I had a lot of guilt about my mom and my relationship. And I didn't know how else to solve it because she's gone. So I just wept. And I sat in our bedroom and I wrote how I felt. And I wept. Dad died. I didn't weep that much. He and I were very close. I knew he got saved. I knew my mom got saved. I knew she's in heaven. I just felt like something was missing from our relationship that we had here. And I know when I get to heaven, she's not going to say, you should have been better to me. I know it'll all be fine. It was a Wednesday night. My dad said, you have church. Why don't you go? And I said, no. The nurses said he wasn't doing well. His heart was really struggling. His lungs weren't working, so his heart was working extra hard. They said, it, it could be. We think it'll be any time. He talked. We talked. We prayed. We laughed. It got to be about 6 o'clock. He said, you have church tonight, don't you? I said, yeah. And he said, you, they need you. That You need to go. I said, it's Wednesday. They'll never miss me. If I don't show up, nobody will even know I'm gone. How's that? Pity party. He goes, no, I'll, I'll be fine. You go. You, you need to do that. So I went. I got halfway to church. My uncle called. He said, I just got here. I asked your dad how he's doing. He said, fine. And then he left. He said, did you cry? Yeah, I, not hard, because I had a good relationship with my dad. Sometimes he drove me nuts. <laughs> the victory was won, verse 2. But David is ruining it. For the people heard, verse 2, say, that day how the king was grieved for his son. Verse 3, the people got them by stealth that day into the city, his people being ashamed steal away when they flee in battle. They, they, it, he, the king made everything touchy. You know how some people are that way? They just put you on edge. You don't know how they're going to act. Some people are, and it's not a biblical word. Some people are just moody, and they need to get over it. Because if we have the victory, we need to be celebrating the victory. And we do have the victory. Jesus won the victory. When he died, read Romans 6. I'm glad for, for a long time I've been reading Romans 6 when I pray. And I pray through it and read it and remind myself. He that is dead is freed from sin. And when Christ died, I died, right? So I'm freed from sin. Say, so I'm going to feel like it. It doesn't matter how I feel. It matters what God said. So I reckon that. I yield to that. David just couldn't do that. His, his guilt and his grief and his sorrow overtook him. Verse 4, the king covered his face. The king cried with a loud voice, Oh, my son, Absalom, Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. And Job came to the house of the king and said, verse 5, wow, everybody needs a friend like Job. Thou hast shamed this day the faces of all thy servants, which this day have saved his life. Now, I don't know if Job's saying that based on the fact that you can still be saved and act dumb. Right? It's possible that Absalom was saved. God doesn't unsave you when you act dumb, right? 
or many of you, did I, I'm us, many of us would be unsaved. So Job confronts the king. He said, you, you've caused people to be ashamed of what they did, ashamed that they're aligned with you. That's a bad testimony, isn't it? Boy, I want a good testimony. I want my testimony to speak to people. I want my life, my actions, the way I live. Job said, you've shamed this day. Verse 5, the faces of thy servants, which this day have saved thy life, and the lives of thy sons and thy daughters, the lives of thy wives, the lives of thy concubines. I think, I don't want to be a scholar. I just want to be a better Christian. And I think that means, and by the way, the Holy Spirit can help me do that, can he? I think Job is saying, Absalom may have really gone on a killing streak. Maybe there's a reason God took him out of the way. Did you ever go through that? Had a flat tire? And you go, I can't understand this. Maybe God was saving you from something. We look at it, we go, ooh. But God knows exactly what he's doing. Why did this happen? Why did they leave? Why did they say this or do that? Wow, verse 6. Job said, in that thou lovest thine enemies. That's harsh, isn't it? I mean, it would, be, it would be drastic to say that to anybody. But to say that to the king, the guy that can kill a giant with a rock, I mean, is that wise? What if David grabbed his sling and put a rock in it and said, Job, what, what did you say? Job said, you, you've loved, verse 6, you love your enemies, you hate your friends. Anybody ever talk that way to you? Wake you up? Huh? Remember my incident in speech class? Mr. Crockett, you're full of pride. Boy, that's the last thing I thought I had. You're full of pride. You need to confess that pride to God is sin. I'll, I'll leave here. I'll leave here. I'll quit this whole thing. And then I heard messages seem like that week on quitters. Yeah, just quit, just go home, just leave, give up, it gets hard. Job said, you love your enemies, you hate your friends. Verse 6, for thou hast declared this day that thou regardest neither princes nor servants. For this day I perceive that if Absalom had lived and all we had died this day, that it had pleased thee well. Ouch. How do you respond to that? You know how you respond? I am the man. I am the man. I'm, that's me. Remember when Nathan said that, thou art the man. David should have said, that, that's me. You're talking about me. That's me. Verse 7. Now, therefore. He doesn't just go after him. He tells him how to fix it. Isn't that nice? He says, now, therefore, rise, go forth. Speak comfortably. And literally, that means in the Hebrew, speak from your heart. Don't speak from your feelings. Talk about your book. Speak from your heart. Just go after them comfortably. He said, for I swear by the Lord, if thou go not forth, there will not tarry one with thee this night. And that will be worse unto thee than all the evil that befell thee from thy youth until now. Joab knew the guys. David knew that Joab knew the guys. Hey. He said, this is going to happen. If you blow this, verse 8, the king arose, sat in the gate. Doesn't say he wept in the gate, says he sat in the gate. And they told unto all the people, saying, Behold, the king does sit in the gate, and all the people came before the king, for Israel had fled every man to his tent. It's easy to get caught up in something. It's easy to get caught up in our emotions. I get emotional. 
Can you, can you believe that? I just, everything is super, the older I get, the more emotional. So you ought to get a handle on that. I don't want to get a handle on being emotional. I, don't, I want to get a handle on when it's sinful. But I want to be emotional. Right? David danced. He didn't say, we're so glad the ark's back. And everybody would stand around and go, man, he is really excited, isn't he? And he smiled once. We're really glad the ark's back. No, it says he danced, right? With all his might. He was emotional. It's possible to get emotional and it hurt you or hurt others. Job said, you're emotional. It's your boy. He's gone. Nothing you can do. He's just struggling. David's just struggling to get over it. That's not bad. It's bad if you don't get over it. It's not bad to struggle. Fix it. Job said, here's what you do. Go to the people. Be available. Let them talk to you. Tell them what a great job they did. Thank them. Pray with me. Father, I pray that our lives will be helped because of this story. That every negative would be a positive in our life. That every negative story, every rough, hard, harsh, hurtful, ugly story in the Bible, but especially this one today, that it would be a challenge to the way we live. Thank you. Thank you, God, for dying for us, for choosing us. Jesus said, you have not chosen me, but I've chosen you. Thank you, Lord. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. David got, let's do that blanket, and then we'll get into the three things. David got caught up in his grief. Nothing wrong with grief, but you can grieve too long. James said, let your laughter be turned to mourning. You can laugh too much. A guy said to me this week, could I say something to you? I, don't, I know his name. I don't know him. I just know of him. I said, sure. He said, are you always up? And I said, I wish. He said, well, every time I see you, you're up. I said, well, maybe it's for you. I said, I struggle. He said, I just wanted to know. I said, now you know. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> David got caught up in his grief, and he ignored everyone and everything else. There's a time, Solomon wrote, there's a time to weep. The time to cry, time to laugh, time to plant, time to die. The time to celebrate. Job said the men want to celebrate. It's a victory. David, he said, you're acting like it, it's a defeat. You've, you've shamed, you've confused the men. You, you bring the ark home and you dance. You shame yourself to celebrate what God's done. Now God's given us a victory. Absalom's gone, and you're acting like it's horrible. I don't want my life. Listen to me. I, don't, I can't speak for you. I don't want my life to confuse people. I want it to be consistent. I don't want to be ashamed of who I am. I don't want to be ashamed that I belong to God, that I serve God. I don't want to cause someone to be disappointed in my life, especially God, but I don't want other people to be disappointed. And that's, that's how Joab is coming across to David. He said, when he said, verse 5, you've shamed this day the faces 
You've affected how they look at you and how they look at victory. You've affected how they look at God. Boy, I, I don't want to affect the way. I want people to think nothing but good of God. And sometimes I don't get God. Sometimes I don't understand him. Sometimes he makes me mad. But I love him and trust him. And I don't want people to turn away from God because of my life. Because I'm overboard in something. Listen, are you listening? This is hard in some areas for some of us. We get overboard. David is overboard. And Job said, time, time, I'm sorry. I, I just, Job wants him to snap out of it. Let's go. Let's move on. Absalom's gone. You're the king. God took Absalom all the way. You didn't hang him in that tree. Time to move on. Boy, it's fun when God takes care of things, isn't it? Absalom wanted to go helmetless. Sorry, George. Absalom wanted to go without a helmet. And the tree caught his hair. Who could do that? Oh, well, long hair, it's a consequence, happens. It does. How many, give me another time it's happened. God did that. God can do anything like that. So, Job wants to help. And I don't think Job's a perfect man, but I think he was in touch with God. And I'm not a perfect man, and so if you gauge what you should get from me upon my mistakes, then you'll never listen to me. So Job gives great advice to David. He tells him three things. Number one, David, you need to step out of it. You need to get over it. He says, number one, don't punish yourself. Did Jesus die on the cross? Did he die? Did God forsake him? Did he bleed? Did he hang with other thieves? Did they bury him? God's happy. That's what God wanted. If you died, he wouldn't be happy. I mean, think of that. That Put all the theological words you can together. That's what happened. The only way for God to be happy is if Jesus was punished for your sin. I don't have to punish me. I don't have to punish myself. I don't have to walk on, on, on rocks up a stairway in Spain to try to pay for my sins. My sins have been paid for. Job said, don't punish yourself. When I got saved, I was guilty. That's why I got saved. I saw, I saw, I never saw before. I saw that I was a sinner. I saw that I couldn't save myself. I saw that I couldn't pay for my sin. I saw that Jesus paid for my sin. I saw that God found Jesus guilty for my sin. For he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The word isn't there, but it's all over that verse. God found Jesus guilty for my sin. So either Jesus paid for all my sin or he didn't. Sometimes someone will surprise us with their wisdom. Joab surprises me with his wisdom. But it's true, is it not? Sometimes God will guilt you to push you to trust him. I'm not talking about false guilt. Oh, I just feel guilty. You need to get over If God's forgiven you, you need to just rejoice that he died for your sins and he forgives you. If you're living in sin, yeah, you ought to be guilty. God's trying to push you to run to him, to trust him, to repent. Chapter 12, I'm just going to grab this and read it. Chapter 12 and verse 13, when Nathan comes and exposes David's sin. Verse 13 of chapter 12, David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. 
Same verse. Nathan said unto David, The Lord hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. Hey, what better than that? You can't pay for your sin. Job is saying, David, you can't pay for this. God told you it would happen. Accept it. Move on. David needed, I hate this phrase, but I'm going to say it anyways. David needed to forgive himself. Because God forgave him. I said to my kids, when they start having kids, I said, now you understand something. They said, what's that? I said, being a father. They said, yeah. I said, is there anything I could have done different when I raised you? Because I know you get smart when you have kids, and you ask, and you listen, and you read. And they said, Dad, no, and don't punish yourself. The smart Alex said, you can't change it anyways. <laughs> Why do you want to, what are you going to do? Sometimes it just feels good, doesn't it? Punish yourself. Sounds crazy, but it's true. We feel like we're paying for it. I want them to know, what? I want them to know that if I've made mistakes in raising them that I feel bad about. Job said, David, move on. Lock on to today. Remember he kept saying that. He said, uh, I love the wording. Verse 7, now therefore, now therefore rise, go forth. Speak comfortably unto thy servants, for I swear by the Lord, if thou go not forth, there will not tarry one with thee this night. And that will be worse unto thee than all the evil that befell thee from thy youth until now. Take care. What, what do you need to do now, this night? Yeah, but no. David had no reason to feel guilty. He's taking the blame for what Absalom did. God forgave him and wanted him to move on. Don't punish yourself, Job said. Number two. Number two. He tells him not to waste time feeling guilty. Did you ever see someone that looked like they did something? They're kind of looking around. They see you, look at them, they look away. You're thinking, what's their deal? Job is saying, don't waste time. Feeling guilty. If I, if I sit in this chair and go, I can't listen to the preaching because I'm such a sinner, God is saying, hey, 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 do something about it. We, we like the feeling guilty, but what are we doing to correct it? Here's the word for you. It's called repent. You turn from it. You, you turn away from it and you turn towards God. Once you turn away from it, you turn towards God. You head that way. You can't pay for your sin. They've been paid for. If, verse John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I would have a big problem with that verse if the last part wasn't there. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That means there's nothing you can do about your sin. But notice what he says prior to that, if we say that we have not sinned. So you admit it, right? I'm a sinner. But then you say, but he's faithful and just. False, you know what false guilt does? Makes Jesus look inadequate. If you have to work for your salvation, then his death wasn't enough. Well, 
I'm trying to be good. Skip it. Quit wasting your time. Jesus was more than adequate. He, listen, the word just and justifier, look it up. Justification comes from the word satisfy. The only thing could satisfy God was God. Romans says he is just and the justifier. If you died, God would go, wow, they're going to be in hell forever. But when Jesus died, what's it say? For me, he made him to be sin for us. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. You read that whole book of Romans, that, that whole doctrinal uh, flow there is that there's none righteous, right? But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Isn't it amazing how we like the big words and we skip the little words? I kind of like those two little words, for us. He made him to be sin for us. And you're spending all your time on the big words. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So if I take that literally, I can't punish myself hard enough. And that means that I get into heaven not because of what I do, but because of what he did. And he gets the credit. Guilty feelings don't pay for sin. Paul made a statement to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. You can jot it if that works for you. He said, verse 10, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. In other words, once you repent, don't say, wait, did I, should I, was that enough? For godly sorrow worketh repentance, not to to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. I'm bad, I'm sorry, what can I do? I'll try to do this. I don't have to do it. When I get up in the morning, I don't do anything to get saved. I was saved all night. I'm saved in the morning. When I'm talking to God, I'm God's child. And I don't know about you, but I do pretty good at night when it comes to sin. I mean, I'm sleeping, thank God I'm not sinning. I have some weird dreams sometimes. I'll say to Amy, listen to this one, and she'll just be like, I'll go, I, well, tell me. I had one about the neighbor, and it was weird. And she goes, I go, don't, because I'm already feeling that way. And, and have you talked to him lately? No. Have you seen him? No. pretty sure there was no sin so I wake up and I don't have a whole lot of sin to confess from all night but I'm still a sinner I, I thought of this let me see if I can find it I just wonder because y'all if I y'all have a preconceived idea if I tell you what it is I think it's in here the verse says, I think we sang this lately. Could my tears, this is verse 2. Say, what song? Hold on. Could my tears forever flow? Could my zeal, no languor, no. These for sin could not atone. Thou must save. And thou alone. In my hand, no price I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. What's the song? Rock of Ages. Isn't that good? See, I think we sing it, we go, oh, that was nice, but it doesn't soak in. 
simply to thy cross I claim. That's enough. I mean, I, I know how to be good. I just don't always like it, but I know how. And when I'm bad, I feel like I have to pay for it. David said, or Joab tells David, verse 6, it's almost like you're feeling sorry for yourself. Satan wants you to live in self-pity. He wants you to live like God didn't mean it when he died for you. He wants you to live like God might take it back if you don't shape up. And that's not true. Number one, don't punish yourself. Number two, don't waste time feeling guilty. Number three, God took all of our guilt. I love, I love. Have you read Isaiah 53 lately? Isaiah 53. He starts out verse 1. Can you just listen? Verse 1, he says, Who hath believed our report? In other words, who could believe it? You know what he's going to talk about, right? So he starts out, he says, who could believe it? Who had believed our report? And to whom, listen, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Arm, strength, God's strength. He tells us, verse 2, he should grow up. Verse 3, he's despised and rejected. Verse 4, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Listen to verse 6 and 7. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Verse 7. He was oppressed. And he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Don't miss that. He didn't plead his case. Wait a minute, I'm innocent. No one was more innocent than Jesus. No one was more guilty than us. He took all our guilt. So we don't have to have self-pity. We don't have to punish ourselves because that can never match what Jesus did on the cross. Don't ever, 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 ever forget what it cost him to save you. That's why since last Sunday night, I've been listening to that song repeatedly every day to rescue a sinner like me. Because sometimes I think, hey, I'm not that big of a sinner. I'm sinning a lot less than I used to. Hey, there are other people bigger sin. And God was like, no. I still had to die. To rescue a sinner like me. Read the word. Look it up. Read the word. He abandoned his throne for a life such as mine. God only sees. What Jesus did on the cross to satisfy him. Everything, that, I want to say this because I want to be controversial and some of you aren't listening, so maybe this will help you listen. Everything you do to try to save yourself or punish yourself only makes God mad. Because it cheapens what he did. Don't cheapen what God did. If other people don't forgive you, listen to me. I want to give you a, a great piece of advice. If other people don't forget you, forgive you, 
That's their problem. I'm telling you. If other people won't forgive, that's their problem. God's word is the only thing that matters. Get over it. Get over it. You don't know what they said to me. Get over it. You don't know how they hurt me and they're gone. Get over it. You're going to spend time coddling yourself when God has something he wants you to do. I don't know if you've ever done it. It happens to me. I know I'm supposed to witness to someone, but I'll be so caught up in something about me, about something else. I'm busy. I'll say, Lord, send somebody else. I'm busy. And the Lord will say, you're here right now. Huh? Ever been there? Doesn't feel good. Do what the Lord wants you to do. Whatever he says. Whatever he says, do. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, you know there are areas of my life that I just need to get over it. The devil is a master at offense. Everybody's a Offended. We get offended. They offended me. I'm offended. Sometimes, Lord, we talk ourselves into punishing ourselves, paying for something we could never pay for, begging someone, please forgive me. As long as we repent, it's no longer our problem. Help us to see that. Help us to snap out of it. Help us not to punish ourselves. Help us not to waste time feeling guilty. And help us to realize God took all of our guilt. And if we're feeling guilty, we just need to go to him and say, okay, you took my guilt here Take this guilt from me. I don't want to be guilty. I don't need to be guilty. It's hurting me. It's wasting time. It's, it's punishing me. It's tormenting me. Help me to get out, off of it, get over it, move on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for what you've done for us. I pray this. In Jesus' name, amen.